you just joined us today, my name is Michael Hart and I'll be your Kahoot Learning Host for the 60 Minute CPA Australia webinar ASA 540 Auditing Accounting Estimates presented by Renee Herman and Claire Greatston and also supported by Michelle Webb in the chat box. Just going ahead, I'm opening up the mic for the presenters, passing control. Enjoy the webinar everyone. Thank you, Michael, and welcome everybody to this CPA Australia and uh, Australian Auditing and Assurance Standards Board joint webinar presentation on ASA um, 540, Auditing Accounting Estimates and Related Disclosures. Um, so I'm Claire Grayson, CPA Australia's Policy Advisor for Audit and Assurance, and I'm hosting the session, and Renee will be presenting um, the material today. And before I introduce Renee, I just, um, I just note that that um, ASA 540 that we're discussing today is a um, new ASA um, applicable for periods commencing on or after 15 December 2019. So that means that it'll impact audits um, for periods ending December 2020. And also um, if you're a junior end or your clients are junior ends, then 30 June 2021. Now that sounds a long way away, but um, as I'm sure Renee will be explaining to us, um, practitioners um, really will benefit in being prepared for this. And, um, and it will help in auditing estimates in the meantime and certainly working through the stand to see how, how we impact. So, um, so thank you very much, um, Renee, for coming uh, from the Auditing Assurance Standards Board to talk to us. Now, Renee um, is... Um, the AUASB's Senior Project Manager, who has been responsible for coordinating, firstly, um, Australian, uh, the, well, the Australian feedback to the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, as they uh, firstly um, developed um, ISA 540, on which this standard is based. Um, and um, she was then also responsible, once that standard was issued, for um, adopting that standard, preparing that standard for adoption here in Australia. Um, and she certainly worked very closely with a couple of um, uh, IAASB members um, located in Australia and New Zealand to feedback um, uh, uh, feedback on, on the uh, as it was developed. So Renee is very close to this standard. So um, so welcome, welcome Renee. Thank you, Claire, and good morning, everyone. So in today's webinar, we're going to go through several aspects. We'll start talking about why change. Why did the IAASB and the AUASB even need to change ASA 540? What was wrong with the old one? What are the main changes? We're going to talk about professional skepticism and the importance of it, uh, particularly through this highly judgmental area of accounting. We'll talk through the scalability of the standard. Is the standard for everyone? for all estimates, how is it meant to be applied, what does it mean. I'll take you through some common examples um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what's been done to support you as users of, um, of this new standard. So the aim of the webinar is really to equip you with the information and the knowledge that you'll need to practically implement the revised 540 in your audit engagements. So Renee, perhaps um, before we kick off, um, I might just get a feel, um, Michael, if you could open uh, the polling question, if we could just get a feel from everyone as to um, where you're at with ASA 540. So if you could all um, look at this question in your chat box, um, do you know much about ASA 540? Um, a, no, not really. B, a bit, but I don't understand it. Um, C, yes, and it's all crystal clear. So if you just give your answers to that and uh, click submit, um, and this will give us a feel for, for where, where you're all at. And we're certainly, Renee's here to help you if you're in the no, not really, or the a bit. And if you're all crystal clear, that's fantastic. And we hope that, that what Renee says reflects your knowledge as well. Um, so just um, the last few seconds, um, just, oh, there we go. The poll is now um, complete and um, the responses are um, half of you um, are no, not really, don't really know what it's about and uh, the, other, the other half 
just a bit, and 1% are crystal clear, that's fantastic. Let us know at the end whether we cover it off as well as, as your understanding is. But for the rest of you, um, I will hand over now to Renee because she now knows there's a lot that we can she can share with us to bring our understanding up on this standard. Terrific. I was just thinking, thanks Claire, if it's all C, yes, and it's all crystal clear, well, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do for the rest of the session, so very happy it was in the A and B category, and um, and hoping that at the end of today's session that should, that should flip for you. So let's have a look at why did the IAASB even deem it necessary to revise uh, their ISA 540 impacting our ACE of 540. So the first area is really in relation to complex business environments. So audit risks relating to accounting estimates, they are evolving and those risks are increasing. And the reason for that is, is that financial reporting frameworks are evolving in a complex business environment and that is requiring more complex accounting estimates. Those more complex accounting estimates are just becoming more prevalent and they really now are a fundamental part of financial uh, statements for, for most entities now. And the audit risks are then arising because there is such amount of significant management judgment. And once you've got that management judgment, you then have the potential for management bias and fraud in making those accounting estimates. The audit risk is also because there's a use of much more forward-looking information and a lot more related disclosures around that forward-looking information. The other reason for the change is really to foster an improved exercise of professional skepticism. So inspection findings, and this is not just inspection findings within Australia, it's a worldwide issue. Inspection findings consistently raise significant concerns about audit quality for accounting estimates. And regulators really would like to see this being addressed by fostering a more independent, challenging and skeptical mindset of auditors. So if you have a look at uh, ASIC's recent inspection report, they noticed that in 24% of 347 key audit areas that they reviewed, auditors did not obtain reasonable assurance that the financial report was free of material misstatement. Now that does not mean that the reports had a material misstatement. It just means that the auditors didn't have sufficient appropriate audit evidence on which to base their conclusions. And many of those findings related to auditing accounting estimates. And as I've said, and that is consistent from a worldwide perspective. So there's some very clear public interest needs driving the revision of the standard. So what you can see in your screen, on your screen in front of you, are a number of boxes of key enhancements in this standard. And we're going to talk through those through the progression of the session. But note that I've used the term enhancements, okay? Not everything is new. And sometimes it's just bringing what's already being done currently in practice to the forefront. And sometimes it's just linking the other standards into 540 to make more sense of the topic. So as much content as there is in the standard, and I'm not underplaying the content and the complexity of the standard, if you can bear in mind that all of the enhancements and terms that are used throughout the standard are really designed to appropriately identify what is the risk of a material misstatement and how are you as the auditor going to respond to those risks exercising professional judgment and skepticism and focusing on disclosures and communications. So that's really the essence of all the enhancements that we're going to talk through in this morning's session. So let's start with um, the first enhancement being the introduction of inherent risk factors. Now inherent risk factors are not new. 
when you've done your audit engagements in the past, you've naturally, when you are assessing a risk of something going wrong, these inherent risk factors have always been there. You probably just haven't bucketed them, thought about them, articulated them, or categorized them in the fashion that 540 is pushing you towards. 540 really recognizes three key inherent risk factors. Those are estimation uncertainty, complexity, and subjectivity. And the standard recognizes that every single accounting estimate is subject to estimation uncertainty. Estimate by its very nature, there's a lack of precision. So any estimate will be subject to a level of estimation uncertainty. Complexity and subjectivity, that's where you need to start giving it some thought. How complex is the process of making your estimate? Such as when you've got multiple data sets or significant assumptions or when you've got complex modeling. And that's when the auditor would need to start thinking about their need of specialist skills. Subjectivity arises from inherent limitations in knowledge or data. So this is where we expect management judgment and hence the opportunity for management bias. So those are the three key inherent risk factors. And they have been designed to focus the auditor's attention on the risks within accounting estimates. The standard does also recognize a category called other. And it really is to catch all. So if somebody came up with something that didn't fit into the categories of estimation, uncertainty, subjectivity, um, and complexity, there is this other. And the other is really where you've got a change in the nature or circumstances of a financial statement item, or the requirements of the applicable financial reporting framework may have changed, and to draw the auditor's attention to the susceptibility due to management bias or fraud in making those estimates. So Renee, um, in relation to the inherent risk factors, perhaps we can go to a polling question now. Uh, Michael, um, yes, if you open the, the polling question. So um, we're interested to hear from you all, um, are those inherent risk factors that Renee outlined, um, estimation uncertainty, complexity, subjectivity, and other, um, <clears throat> will they be helpful in determining the risk of material misstatement? What's your feeling on that? And secondly, Will they result in more areas being in scope, so increased audit work effort? So we're just asking you to click on A, B, or C. So your initial feeling is no, that, that those factors won't be helpful and, 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 it may, and it won't change the areas of focus. Secondly, that you think they would be helpful, um, and, but still will not change the areas of focus. Or thirdly, yes, they'll, they'll not only be helpful, but will change the areas of focus, perhaps um, increase those. Um, oh, let's close. So I hope I hope you all got um, a chance to answer answer that those polling quest that polling question. Um, just just going to jump in at this point. Sorry to cut across you. Uh, there was 130 people that did not answer. So when we see we've got five more, three more polls to come up, when you see the poll uh, pop open, I need you to respond straight away. So please don't delay. I need you to respond straight away to get your results through. So here's the, uh, the polling results from those that did answer. Thanks, Michael. Look, I realize this question is a little complex, so it's fine um, if you weren't able to respond in this instance. Obviously, you can message Michael if you're having troubles, technical troubles. Um, but look, it's also fine to just be thinking through, um, you know, how, how this is going to impact you. So, so the um, feeling from the audience then is that um, most of you, um, yes, think it will be helpful, don't think it will change order areas, 43% that was, and 37% um, and yes, helpful and will change. So, so this is going to have quite an impact, Renee, I think this standard is the initial feeling from the audience. Yeah. So the general feel that, that we are getting on outreach is that people actually really are finding these factors uh, helpful in terms of focusing their attention as to whether it will or won't increase what's in scope. 
as 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 has come through, kind of 50-50. So some people believe, yep, this focus will will increase scope, and others believe probably that they've already covered it, which is which is fine. But the most important thing is that people are finding the factors uh, helpful. I'll just step in here. There's a comment just being made in the chat box from Paul, which says that the question does not allow for helpful and may change. So he's just yeah, adding a yeah, a absolutely. And I think uh, Renee, in this early stage in this presentation, of course, not everyone's sort of going to be able to make that judgment. Absolutely, yet, and that's fine. fine. It's just really a gauge for us just to understand you know, how, how people are feeling at the moment. So your response might just be a guttural response and, and not necessarily based on, on, on knowledge yet because you haven't yet implemented the standards. So that's fine. Let's go into having a look at um, the risk assessment stage of uh, 540. Now, when I talk through all these key enhancements. I am going to relate these key enhancements to a simple goodwill impairment uh, carrying value assessment, um, just that you can see how the standard would be used for, for, for something that's pretty common out there, a goodwill impairment calculation. So let's assume a simple business acquisition. Let's just say that a business pays $7 million uh, for assets of six million, and you've got a million dollars of goodwill attributable to business synergies. So let's just keep that in mind as we work through as we work through this. So the first thing that that the new 540 requires is a separate assessment of inherent risk and control risk. Up until now, the planning standards of the suite of standards do not require a separate assessment of inherent risk and control risk. And firms at the moment will really uh, differ it depends on what your firm methodology currently is. Just flagging that the new ISA five uh, 315, the risk assessment uh, standard that is out on exposure or the exposures closed that the IAASB is opening and revisiting, will also require a separate inherent risk and control risk assessment. The second part of the risk assessment is to explicitly recognize something called a spectrum of inherent risk, and that's meant to drive scalability. So to demonstrate that 540 is scalable, from really simple to really complex, the IAASB introduced and emphasizes something called the spectrum of inherent risk concept. And under the spectrum of inherent risk concept, the assessment of inherent risk will depend on the degree to which those inherent risk factors affect the likelihood or the magnitude of a misstatement. Now, for all of you out there, it's probably no different to what you're currently doing. When you're thinking about your um, risk assessment at the moment, you're probably categorizing into low, medium, high. This spectrum of risk is exactly the same thing, but it's being called something now. And then there are also enhanced risk assessment procedures. And this is really around the obtaining and understanding of the entity and its environment, including the entity's internal controls. And this was deemed necessary, particularly with reference to the changes in business environment, including increasing complexity of information systems and complex modeling. Because you as the auditor, really need to understand how management is identifying their methods, their assumptions, their data. How is management assessing the estimate? How is management making a decision as to whether they should use specialist skills? That's all done at the risk assessment phase. So let's think about what I spoke about, our little goodwill impairment, and let's use 540 at this risk assessment phase. So you've understood that you've bought this business, you've understood the business, you've understood the processes, you've understood the controls. Let's look at those inherent risk factors, complexity, um, subjectivity, estimation, uncertainty. It's a goodwill impairment calculation. Of course, there's estimation uncertainty. How complex is this? Well, chances are in this little scenario that we're talking about, you've probably got a discounted cash flow model, probably not overly complex. But let's think about the subjectivity there. 
How many assumptions have you used in that little Excel spreadsheet? How many assumptions have management got in there? Their growth forecasts is an example. And that's where there's potential for management bias coming through there. So without thinking about it in that, in this light that we've just spoken about, you may have said, okay, I've got a discounted cash flow model, all good, low risk, let's move on. What I'm suggesting to you is once you start thinking about those inherent risk factors, you're probably not quite as low as you think you are. You're probably somewhere on that spectrum. So you're not going to be able to just file management's Excel spreadsheet. You actually need to do a little bit of work on that model. There's a fair bit in those management assumptions. Let's move into the next area of controls testing. Now there's nothing new in this area of the standard. What ASA 540 is really just doing is it's linking in to the other planning standards of the risk assessment and the response to the risk assessment standards. So there's nothing new here, it's all already in 315 and 330. But the standard now is reminding you, there's requirements that remind you, that you will need to test the operating effectiveness of controls if there's an expectation that those controls are operating effectively, or where your substantive procedures alone will not give you sufficient appropriate audit evidence. Okay, and the auditor needs to take into account that the more reliance that you're going to place on effective operation of controls, then the more persuasive your audit evidence needs to be, the more you're going to need to test those controls. And the standard also reminds you that where you have significant risks, you cannot rotate controls. So nothing new, just a reminder what's in the other standards. So let's have a look at our goodwill. What we're going to do about the controls testing element of 540. In this scenario, we might well document that we're not going to test controls because we believe that the substantive testing that we're going to do on this calculation will be sufficient. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't need to understand the controls. You always need to understand the system of controls just means you might not test them. Now let's get into the nuts and bolts of the work effort, the key enhancements around the work effort. And the boxes that you're seeing on your screen are in no particular order. In fact, they're not in order at all because I'm first going to talk about the second box on the left-hand side that you're seeing. And this is really important, is that the new 540 actually keeps the same testing strategies that the old 540's got. And it really gives auditors three options to test an estimate. You can have a look at what's happening post-balance sheet. You can test what management has done. Or you need to go and develop your own point estimate or range. So nothing has changed. There are still those three strategies. What has changed is the way the work is structured around whichever strategy you have selected. There are now objective-based work effort requirements, and those requirements are all filtered around methods, assumptions, and data. And the reason for that is, if you think about it, how would management come up with an estimate? Management would have to come up with a method. Management would need some assumptions, and management would be using data. So as auditor, it would make sense to audit the same way that management would need to be coming up with that estimate in the first instance. The other area of change is that the standard has sought to strengthen the requirement for auditors where management has not appropriately understood estimation uncertainty. Now, to address concerns about the auditor assuming the responsibilities of management or creating threats to auditor independence, there is a requirement for the auditor to first 
request management to perform additional procedures. So that's the first thing that you, the auditor, needs to do. So where you think management haven't appropriately addressed estimation uncertainty, go away and ask them to do more. And in that sense, there's application materials and guidance that indicates that in considering whether it's practical to develop your own estimate or range, you might need to take into account whether you can do that without compromising your independence. Now the aim is not for the auditor to come up with a number that management uses. The aim is for the auditor to make an independent assessment of what management's giving them. So that's the first way, the first thing that needs to happen. If management are still not getting this right, where practical, the auditor may well go away and develop their own estimate or range. And as I've just said, that's not to give management a number to use, that's to independently sense check what management's giving you. And third of all, if you've really still got a problem, you need to consider whether there's a breakdown of controls and you need to be reporting to those charged with governance. The other area that the standard has sought to expand upon and to provide more guidance is the enhanced approach for the auditor coming up with their range or their point estimate. Now if the auditor has deemed it practical and comes up with their own range to evaluate management, your auditor only needs to determine a range that's supported by appropriate audit evidence. And the audit evidence needs to support the range, not necessarily a particular number within the range. Now there's application material because the question always gets asked, well, what happens if the auditor's range that they are coming up with is in multiples of materiality? So that question always comes up. And the standard has sought to address it by clarifying that that might well eventuate, and that might be an appropriate outcome. But the standard recognizes that that might be an appropriate outcome, but it is usually, it is usually where you are in sectors, for instance, the banking and insurance sector. So they are not expecting that multiples of materiality range to cause an issue for, let's call it, the SME market. However, if you do find yourself in that position, the application material and the guidance suggests to auditors that you should be revisiting whether you have gathered enough evidence to support where you are at. And if you still hand on heart feel you have and you are within multiples of materiality, that is where the disclosures become really, really important. Now, let's, let's Think about what I've just spoken through in terms of the goodwill, uh, in terms of the goodwill um, example that I've given you. So let's link the goodwill example into thinking about the methods, assumption, and data. So when applying 540, what method has the client used? Well, in this scenario, we've suggested that they've given you a discounted cash flow model. Is that an appropriate model? You need to determine that and you need to think about that. So, so sorry, let, let me backtrack. Remember I said to you I started that you've really got three testing strategies. When you're thinking about goodwill, you're not going to do post-balance date anything. That's not going to give you anything. So your best method of testing this goodwill is probably to use management's model that they've given you. So management's model, probably a discounted cash flow model. So now let's think about the objective-based requirements in terms of the methods, assumptions, and data. So is that method an appropriate method? Is it accurate? Have you tested that Excel spreadsheet? Have you done the cross-checks? Is that what your other clients are using? Is that what industry is using? Have a think about the assumptions that management's given you. Are you challenging their discount rates that they're using? What about their forecasts? 
They're forecasting 5% growth. Gee, the last five years there's been no growth, it's zero. Does that seem right? Are you doing sensitivity testing? So what happens if you drop the 5% to zero, which is what they've had over the last five years? What's happening then? So are you challenging, are you testing those assumptions? The data that they're using in that model, their starting point, have you tied it back to the trial balance? Is there a revenue figure? Hmm, was that the revenue figure that, that, that was in their trial balance, the assets that they're using? So that's the kind of questioning you should be asking yourself. What method, what, what, what strategy am I adopting? And once I've adopted the strategy, how am I testing those methods, assumptions, and data? So Renee, um, if we can move to a polling question then, um, Michael. Um, <clears throat> so is the structure um, of the audit requirements around these methods, assumptions, and data that Renee was working us through, is that easy for everyone to work with? So do you think that that will result in a more focused audit effort, uh, more structured gathering of audit evidence? So if everyone could, could answer this, polling question, so A, no, it's not easy to work with and, and won't result in effective audit, or do you support this approach and think, yes, it's easy to work with and um, it will result in a more effective audit, or likely to, uh, or C, yes, it's easy to work with but will make no difference to the way you're already doing the audit. Um, so if, um, if everyone could look at that question and remember to press submit. We'll see if we can get a higher participation this time because I rushed you all last time. So um, there we go. So just looking at the results of that polling question now, um, most of you say yes, it'll be easy to work with and will result in a more effective audit. So it's quite a consistent response there. Well, half half of um, the respondents um, felt that way, Renee, and then we've got um, yes, easy to work with, but might not make a difference for 19 percent. Yeah, so very happy with that polling response and, and it's exactly what we, we, we were expecting and, it's, and clearly that's the aim of the standard is to help focus your attention and to, and to, and to, uh, and to be able to uh, have a more efficient or more structured audit around, around some of these areas, so that's a great result. Let's have a look at disclosures. Now, in the existing 540, the objective of the standard use the term reasonable when auditing an accounting estimate, but it used the term adequate for disclosures. Now neither term is defined or explained, but it was viewed by the international board that continuing to use the word adequate for disclosures might inappropriately suggest that disclosures are less important than the estimate itself, which is very much not the case, and certainly not as we get into the more complex areas and the more forward-looking um, estimates. So disclosures relating to accounting estimates, they are critical to users' understanding of the accounting policies applied, it's critical to understand the nature and extent of estimation uncertainty, the key judgments, and other matters relating to, to estimates, in particular where estimation uncertainty is viewed as really high. So when you look at something like our Goodwill example, users of financial statements make decisions uh, based on, on, on net asset positions, and these Goodwill um, carrying values that are in the accounts. People want to understand what is the headroom here? What are the assumptions being used to carry those goodwills, the, those goodwill numbers? So upping the ante to, for, for, from an auditor's perspective to audit to a reasonable rather than adequate standard was viewed as essential by the IAASB. So that's, that's, that's really critical for you to, to recognize that uplift in audit effort in relation to disclosures. Let's have a look at some of the other key enhancements in the standard. The first one being something that we call the stand back requirement. Now people refer to a stand back requirement, but, but if you go and do a, a find function on, on ASA 540, you won't find the word stand back. 
but that's what it is. The standard recognises that the, the standard recognises the central and critical role that professional scepticism has, particularly when auditing accounting estimates. So the standard now has a requirement to stand back and consider all your audit evidence obtained, whether that evidence is corroborative or contradictory when evaluating whether the estimates and disclosures are reasonable. So it's really considering, have I got sufficient and appropriate audit evidence? Now, the standard is not expecting that you go looking for a needle in a haystack when it talks about corroborative or contradictory evidence. You're not meant to go looking for everything that could contradict what management's given you. It's being alert for contradictions. So you in a, let's assume that you are auditing client X, and client X uh, has got growth forecasts of Y. And you've been reading the newspaper, and gee, that industry's taking strain in the news in Australia. Well, how have they got 12% growth forecasts when the newspaper articles that you're reading is showing that industry going backwards? So that's the kind of contradictory evidence you meant to be alert for. It's not going looking for it. The standard now highlights as well that where the auditor can't obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence, then you need to really evaluate what the implications are for your audit. Some of the other enhancements are communication with those charged with governance and management. So the standard is recognizing the importance of that two-way dialogue between the auditor and those charged with governance. And the standard is placing more emphasis on those communications. And that's because of the highly judgmental area of the standard. So professional scepticism. Professional scepticism is really a central and critical theme of the new and revised 540, particularly in light of the judgmental nature of estimates. So what has the standard done? They haven't gone and scattered the word professional scepticism. You can't say thou shalt be professionally skeptical, because what does that even mean? But what the standard has done is they are using much stronger language than we've ever seen before in other standards. They are using language like challenge. They are using language like question, reconsider. So this, so when we look at, for instance, our goodwill model and calculation that we've been speaking through, the growth rate, the forecast, challenge, question, sensitivity check, that is demonstrating professional skepticism. This stand back and having a look at corroborative and contradictory evidence, not ignoring what's coming to the forefront for you, and very importantly, to be documenting the work that you're doing. These challenges, the questioning, the stand back, the thinking about what's coming to the forefront, what's coming to your attention, document it. Scalability, so this is one that everyone asks all the time. How scalable is 540? Who's going to use it? Is it only for the big six audit firms? Is it only for the big guys out there? Is it only for the big banks? Is it only for the insurance sectors? So I'm here to tell you, no, that is very much not the case. 540 is applicable to all estimates. Any business science, any business size industry that has an estimate, auditors need to audit that estimate under the new 540. Now, what does the standard do that makes it scalable? The standard emphasizes that the auditor's further audit procedures need to be responsive to the reason for the risk of material misstatement. So it's saying your response is proportionate to the risk. So your further audit procedures will take into account that the higher your assessed risk of material misstatement, the more persuasive your audit evidence needs to be. So clearly, where estimation uncertainty, complexity, subjectivity are very low, 
your procedures would not be expected to be extensive. And there's that language coming through the standard, where applicable, where appropriate, to the extent necessary. So the standard is very much aiming to be scalable. So let's talk through a simple bonus calculation. All businesses have got bonus calculations. So let's have a look at that simple one. Meet your expectations, we pay you a $5,000 bonus. So let's start at the beginning. I understand the business. Inquire of management, what are you doing? How do you calculate that bonus? Not complex, but meet your target, pay the 5K. Management haven't really got controls about it around that particular area that we can rely on. We're not gonna rely on it. Okay, and we don't need specialist skills. You meet your target, you get $5,000. Let's have a look at the identification of the risk of material misstatement. Is it subjective? No, not really, pretty clear cut. Is it complex? No. Is there estimation uncertainty? No, not really. What's the inherent risk now? Pretty low, I'd suggest. So let's have a look. What's the response gonna be? Remember, you've got your three testing strategies. I'd probably say you're probably going to go select post balance sheet, go and tick off that was, you met the target, you paid 5,000 after year end, done, pretty simple. Let's flip it. Let's say that if you meet your target, there are going to be share options being issued. Okay. So let's understand for management this bonus calculation. Pretty complex once you start getting into share options. There are going to be controls around the number and the valuation of those share options. You're going to need to understand how accurate has management's estimation been in the past. Is management using specialized skills to come up with those calculations? Let's look at the risk of materiality. Is there a lot of subjectivity involved in share option pricing? Absolutely. Is it complex? Absolutely. Might you need an expert? Possibly. Estimation uncertainty, probably pretty high. So your inherent risk of something going wrong when you're coming up with this bonus calculation is probably pretty high. You're not just going to be able to go have a look post balance date. You're not going to have enough information. What's your response going to be? Maybe you'll test how management's made it. Now you're into looking at management's methods, assumption, and data, and considering your use of experts, whether you would need that. So bonus calculation, two sides of the spectrum, and the standard worked for both. And you can really apply that to anything. You can apply that to depreciation, any simple estimate. So if we can go to a polling question now. Um, Thanks, Michael. Um, so based on what Renee has worked through there, those two examples, um, do participants believe that this standard is scalable for all accounting estimates and for all sized firms? So you can answer um, A, B or C. So no, the standard is not scalable and too difficult for SMEs uh, to implement. Um, yes, it's scalable. Uh, but not too difficult for SMEs to implement, or C, yes, the standard's scalable, but still is too difficult for SMEs to implement. So um, if you could answer that polling question and, of course, press submit, um, we'll see how you feel about um, Renee's example and um, whether, you, whether you feel that will be um, able to be scaled in your experience. So that's closed now and we'll have a look at the results and your answers. And most of you, well 48% um, have said yes, the standard is scalable and is not too difficult for SMEs to implement. So that's really encouraging Renee. And then we do have some, uh, well quite a percentage, 28% who have said yes, it's scalable but still too difficult for SMEs to implement. Obviously seeing that is quite a challenge. So where you see that it's still too difficult to implement, I would suggest feed your challenges through to, to CPA, and that's what we'll discuss at the end, is what can be done 
to help practitioners through the difficulties that you are expecting. But very encouraging to see such a, a, a big response to, um, to be. So this slide, so I was going to talk through some common estimation examples. So revenue, I mean, goodwill we've spoken through. And revenue, I am aware of time, but I'm going to try and talk through this revenue example <coughs> fairly quickly. But for you further to understand that some of the new accounting standards out there are applicable to most clients and impact you as an auditor and how that will be um, and how 540 will implement some of those new standards. So if we have a look at something like um, revenue recognition. So let's say, let's just say that uh, you sell widgets for $1,000. And in the past, you may have processed that transaction that you can see on the screen in front of you. Debit debtors, credit revenue, $1,000, I've sold my widgets. And you saying, all I do is sell widgets. And the auditor accepts that entry. Now, it's not to say it's not to say that that entry that you've seen in the past was correct in the first instance. But what I would suggest to you is with the new 540 and with the introduction of the new accounting standard AASB 15, maybe now's your opportunity to be revisiting some of these revenue recognition matters. So let's have a look. AASB 15, the new accounting standard, Essentially, you need to recognize revenue when you are entitled, or the client needs to recognize revenue when they are entitled to earn that revenue. Now, when you are in 540, so there's five steps for the accounting standard in terms of recognizing that revenue. So let's translate step one and two into the auditing of revenue. This is where you might Speak with your client, understand their business, understand their transactions, really drill down and recognize, ah, you sell widgets, but you also need to service those widgets for the next two years. So that little simple revenue calculation, you might well consider your inherent risk factors, and you realize that it's not completely low, the inherent risk, because there's a little bit of judgment into the timing of when you need to service those widgets and how you're going to calculate the service component of those widgets. Because the new accounting standard doesn't let you recognize the full thousand dollars immediately. You, because you have got a cost associated with that thousand dollars and that cost is the servicing of your widgets for the next two years. So step one and two from an accounting perspective, when you are in 540 and you are understanding the business and you are understanding how management is coming up with that revenue service component. So step three and four, when you're working out how much revenue you can take to your P&L in any given year, you've got to think what are you as the auditor going to do to respond to the risk that, you, that the client is recognizing an inappropriate portion directly to revenue. So how have they determined what that service component is? How have they calculated it? Is it based on past history? Is it based on future known events? Where's the data coming from? How accurate is it? What model are they using to come up with it? How does the model work? What are others in the industry doing? Does most servicing happen in the first year? Does most service happen in the second year? What data is there? What evidence is there? So these are the questions that you need to be asking in working out the simple widget calculation. So what you might find out is that your, your sale of your widget for $1,000 actually looks something like what's on your screen in front of you that in actual fact I can only recognize $800 this year because next year I've got $100 worth of a service component and the following year I've got $100 worth of a service component. So what I'm suggesting to you is with the introduction of the new 540 and the introduction of the new accounting standards, use this opportunity to revisit some of these areas with your clients. And even if it's been done perhaps 
inappropriately in the past, well, use this as a good excuse to, to get it right and challenge and, and, and get it right going forward. So, Renee, um, thank you for that presentation. It's been really, really informative. And let's put some polling questions now, Michael, to see how, um, how well um, covered the material is for you. So, at the beginning, um, we asked you a polling question, and now we want to hear how you're feeling. Are you more comfortable now with the requirements of new ASA 540? Um, so, A, B, or C, yes, you're all good, you're on top of it now. Um, B, yes, but still got a way to go to, to really fully understand what it contains, but not, or no, I'm still lost and, and, and would like some more help. Um, please go ahead and answer that question, um, and of course, press submit, and we'll see how you're all going, and then we can talk about whether, <laughs> what assistance you might require. Um, it's not a, we, we realise it's um, a long um, standard. There's a lot of words in it, if nothing else. Um, it's 61 pages, I believe. Um, so last few seconds, we'll see how everyone's feeling. So we've got 69% um, yes, but still a way to go. So that's really encouraging, Renee. I think you've enlightened everybody. Um, and of course, we've always got 29% yes, all good. So that's fantastic, really great that um, really drilled down and, and ma um, made us understand that standard really, really well. And I'll just ask one more polling question um, and then we can go to, to questions, uh, more open questions from you, um, the audience. So firstly, um, if we can just look at this other polling question, um, <clears throat> do you, um, small and medium practitioners, um, need guidance to use this standard? So we've just got A or B, no, the requirements are clear enough, or yes, there's elements that are not clear and it'd be really helpful to have um, guidance for implementation. So please go ahead and give us your views on that and that will really help us and AUASB understand the you know, way forward in making sure that all of you and, uh, and fellow practitioners are, are ready when this standard um, is implemented. So um, sort of last few seconds now, if you can just give your responses um, and then we'll be throwing it open to other questions. So let's see the response to that. We've got 66% um, of you um, would like more guidance, but some areas are still not clear. Um, so look, that, that gives us a really clear steer that we need to do as much as we can to support you all in implementing this standard. And we've got 14% that don't need further, um, further guidance, but um, no, that's really, really helpful. Um, so look, I'd like to thank Renee. Please put your questions in now. If you haven't already, feed us through your questions. Um, and uh, in the meantime, while we're looking at those, I'd just like to say thank you so much to Renee for that presentation. Certainly, I felt it really brought to life the standard and really made it much more accessible for all of us to now go away and look in, in more detail. Um, and we'll certainly look at following up, you know, with further help. So perhaps, Michelle, would, have you got questions you'd like to put? So we had a, a question from David from earlier in the session. So his question was, what extra audit effort do participants think will be required to document the MAD approach? What extra effort? So I guess my response to that question is really where you are at the moment, where practitioners are at the moment in their current documentation. So, you know, if, if taking our goodwill example as, a, as an example, if you're finding, you might well find that you really are already thinking about, about all those elements that we've spoken about, but maybe not use the same terminology as methods, assumption, and data. You might find that there's not that much more of an uplift. Whereas if you now, thinking of the inherent risk factors, if you're now bringing an area into a risk of material misstatement and you're really going to up the ante and focus your audit effort on a particular area, then I would suggest that you would be doing more work on that area, particularly in relation to methods, assumption, and data, and that will, that will in, increase the extent of your documentation. And just to say that that really is the point of the standard, is to lift the game in this area. So 
people are, are somewhat concerned about, gee, is there going to be more work? Is there going to be more documentation? Well, my answer to that question is probably yes, and that is the intention of the standard, particularly when you're having a look at current inspection findings in this area that is seen to be deficient in terms of the sufficiency and appropriateness of, of, of audit evidence. Thank you. So we don't have any other questions that have come into the chat box. So Claire, perhaps you can give us, is there a common denominator in the questions that you've been asked from members? Well, I think the length of the standards is a little bit intimidating. And um, I think what Renee's demonstrated today is you just need to drill down underneath that length. I mean, there's, there's pros and cons. With length, it gives you detail, it gives you guidance, it gives you helpful information. So it's not all a, it's not written to overwhelm. Um, so it, because of the length, it's going to be giving you a lot of the answers. And a lot of it is, okay, um, if applicable, so as Renee was pointing out, so it's um, a case of not getting intimidated, using the resources, and the web, um, the transcript um, of this webinar will be available to members. Those that have attended can listen again when they need to, look at the slides again, or share with their um, colleagues and, and staff. So I think that will really help raise the understanding. Um, we'll certainly, you know, be looking at and talk to AUSB about how, what other tools and helpful support um, can be provided. But I think the documentation thing was a very good question because when our quality review teams go in, that's all they can base um, their understanding of whether you've applied a standard is have you documented that you've applied the standard? So it will be really important to practitioners to know they can work, to demonstrate they've worked through this standard adequately. Now just to say that the IAASB does have a 540 implementation working group, and that working group is or will be working on implementation guidance. So they will be looking at Q&As. So where we see, so, so feed where you need help, feed that through to, to CPA. CPA will feed that through to the AUASB. We will gather that. That will be fed through to the IAASB. So first prize internationally is to have a Q&A done at that international level so that you have the consistency of application around the world. You know, you don't want different countries around the world interpreting the standard in different ways. So if we can understand where people's questions are at, we can feed that through and, and hopefully have, have those questions addressed. Yes, so by all means email us and, and we certainly in close contact with AUSB as well to make sure that um, your comments and views and concerns are heard uh, and, and supported. So what would be the best email address, the submissions inbox or? Uh, yes, uh, that, that would be fine, Michelle. If we put it on the um, page with the webinar but uh, so that everyone's got. Submissions at cpaaustralia.com.au. <coughs> yes. Okay. So, yeah, so thank you for that question and, and so thank you all, I guess, also as well for your attendance. And um, look, it's, <clears throat> it's a very important area and obviously, you know, dealing with those risks, um, it's going to be one of the highest areas of risk in, in the engage, many engagements. So I um, uh, really appreciate um, Renee's time and um, that I think the presentation is incredibly clear. So um, thank you for your attendance. And we'll, Michael, if you can, we'll hand back to you to formally close off the session. Thank you for that. I just want to extend a thank you to the presenters today, Renee Herman and Claire Grayston, and also the support from Michelle Webb as well. A terrific webinar, very informative. Thanks for everyone's participation. It was great to see those questions come through and also your responses to the poll questions as well. I don't see any further questions popping into the chat box, so that will conclude today's webinar. Simply click the X in the top right hand corner of the WebEx environment. You'll be directed to a feedback form. I'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to fill it in. It'll take about 30 seconds, depending on your responses. I know the presenters would love to have your feedback, as would CPA Australia as well. Thanks again for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the day, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.